That's a beautiful song, isn't it? Straight from Scripture of Isaiah 6. Uh, and yet, today we speak to you a message that's entitled, uh, The King and I. You know, Broadway production as well as movies have been titled, The King and I. Now, I'm not preaching a message based on that movie or Broadway production. It's based on the Scripture of Isaiah chapter 6. In 1941, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be in your 70s or 80s to know the most memorable event of that year was December 7th of 1941, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. 1963 is a year that stands out, and you didn't have to be living in Dallas, Texas to know what happened during that year. When the news hit all across the world that President John F. Kennedy was shot in Dallas. In 2001, you don't have to think too far back, and all of a sudden 9-11 comes to mind, and you remember where you were and what was taking place. 2020 will be one of those years again, 10, 15 years, 20 years down the road, we look back and we'll think about the pandemic, the quarantine, and all of the social distancing, mask wearing, and all the fashions and styles that have been created because of it. The prophet Isaiah had a memorable date in his life, and it's recorded right there in Scripture in Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, but verse 1 is that year. In the year that King Uzziah died, comma, in the year that King, King Uzziah died, this is what it says, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and His robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above Him. Each one had six wings. With two, He covered His face, and two covered His feet. And the two, he, and two flew. One called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundation of the doorway shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. And then I said, Woe to me, I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and yet and live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, then one of the seraphim flew to me, and his hand was a glowing coal that had taken from the altar with the tongs. He touched my mouth with it, and he said, Now this, th now that this has touched your lips. Your wickedness is removed, and your sin is atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord say, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. So if you were to ask, you know, Isaiah, 20 years later, Isaiah, can you tell me, is there one particular date that comes to mind that you can say revolutionized who you are as a prophet? I guarantee you he would probably say it was the year that King Uzziah died. And I'm sure all throughout his lifetime, he realized what had taken place when that experience happened in his life. The prophet Isaiah had that memorable moment that's recorded in Isaiah 6, verse 1. And yet, now the whole aspect of those eight verses are filled with the colorful nature of the vision of Isaiah, a fresh vision, a vision that Isaiah knew that was no ordinary vision and no ordinary walk in the park that he had that day. Because this is what happened. He saw God. Now, I don't know about you. <laughs> if you could record in your life, in your journal, 
and in the chapters of your book that you're writing from the moment you die to the moment you're born to the moment you die, and if you could put that in your book, and it says this statement, in this year of my life, I saw the Lord. It has to be a time that transforms who you are. It has to be a time that causes you to realize that it is the, the day or year in your life that stands above all others. Life under the Lordship of Christ is, is exuberant and it's exciting. And sure, it's often filled with risk. It's often filled with dangers from our comfort zones but it explodes with opportunities to serve and to grow in the process. It's a daily adventure. It's an adventure because we are in the service of the master. We're in the service of the king. We move from the king's court to the king's lands. We go from the king's joy and to the, the ministry of the heartache and the criticalness of the sinfulness of all humanity. We go from the perfection and we move into the profane. We go from the sacred of, our, of the moment of the courtship to the everyday life. And we never forget that inside the courtship, we saw the, we saw the king, we saw the Lord. And it affects who we are. It all starts with seeing God in such a fresh and new way, looking at God through the eyes like Isaiah and willing to do whatever the Lord asks, willing to follow no matter how much the cost. I know it's difficult to say yes to a journey. As we began our service, those who were not online with us, we made an announcement that a couple is going to be leaving us in the area. And I know that Dave and Mary, it's not easy leaving a place that you're very comfortable and you didn't really want to leave. But it's exciting to know that you can go, anybody can go in service from the king's courtship to the everyday world and know that in the process of life, seeing and being with the king is transformation in our everyday walk of relationship with God. Like Isaiah there are several things we can do so that the king and I will be more than the title. It will be more than a production. It will be an unbelievable relationship between you and the king of kings, between I and the king of kings. So let me give you three things to think about today, about our relationship with the king based on the relationship that we see Isaiah has and had in that particular moment of his life. And notice, first of all, is that Isaiah first contemplated the holiness of God. It's not about his contemplation of himself at this point. It is all about God. It is contemplating the holiness of God. And what I call mouth agape, you know, we receive agape and those little gifts that someone gives us. And, you know, it's basically defined as love gifts to us, given from grace uh, that, that, that God works in our life. Well, Isaiah gives mouth agape to God. He says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And yet he, it's, it's, it's amazing that in the stunned silence, the Lord appears on his throne encircled by the awesome sight of the seraphim, the flaming ones who cries out louder and louder, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. Holy, holy, holy. Let's first establish who Isaiah was who he actually was seeing on the throne before we identify who he was. The Apostle John quotes the prophet's words of Isaiah 6 that's recorded in John chapter 12 
verse 41. And this verse basically says that, that he, he was, as Isaiah was foretelling that many people would see Jesus with their eyes but not believe on him in their hearts. Then John summarized the passage and says, Isaiah says these things because he saw his glory and he spoke about him. The Lord seated on his throne in the Old Testament then was none other than the Jesus Christ who is recorded in the New Testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he saw him. He saw the Lord. And what were the words that the angels repeated in Jesus' presence? Holy, holy, holy. It's amazing. When you look at, you know, of all the times in Scripture that are repetitive descriptions of the character of God, it is only holy, holy, holy you will find. Seven out of every 12 references about the name of God in the Old Testament refer to him with the adjective of holy. That's more than any other description that we could put together and find in, inside Scripture. Above else, he is holy. The chief attribute of God is not his virtual power. You don't hear the seraphim shouting, omnipotent, omnipotent, omnipotent. The Lord of hosts. The chief attribute of God is not his visual perception. The seraphim are not shouting, omniscient, 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 the Lord of hosts. The chief attribute is not his visible presence. The seraphim are not shouting, omnipresent, 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 the Lord of hosts. When the angels looked at God, they saw holy, holy, holy. The main tool for creating this emphasis in Hebrew poetry is the element of repetition. It's just like if you took a, a sentence and you underlined it or you italicized it or you bolded it or you capitalized it to make emphasis in your sentence. This is what the Hebrews were doing. Holy, 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 magnifying that the holiness of God is the character above all descriptions of his character. And if you don't get the first part of who he is, you've missed the Lord. And Isaiah saw the Lord in the year that King Uzziah died. In all of the years that Isaiah lived on the face of the earth, there is the one experience that he goes back to that revolutionizes him, that changes him, that transforms him, that commissions him, that gives him his joy, that gives him his service, that gives him all his motivation, and it goes back to the character of the holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. So you've got in your relationship to Christ, your relationship to God, your relationship to the Holy Spirit, God three in one, you've got to go back to the holiness because without it, you've missed him. God is in control. He, see, he is seated in his authority and he is in control. And that seat of authority that Uzziah had occupied for five decades. The stability that he produced in the nation as a king was very welcoming. Even though they have approaching armies that are ready to take over the land, yet while that throne in Judah was now empty, God was showing him that the throne of heaven is so full. Uzziah had been shown to be mortal when the heavenly king is showing himself to be immortal. And Isaiah sees for the first time in his life that God is in control. And you and I must keep that in our heart and mind. As the world all over 
is searching for answers and looking for science and looking for data and looking for numbers and looking for statistics and looking for drugs and looking for a vaccine. You've got to know that your life's goal and life's history, your life is never going to be dependent upon whether a, va a vaccine is created or not or whether a virus exists or not. At some point in our life, we trust the Lord, we live for Him, and we recognize that He is in control. Amen. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Greatness, the greatness of God is real. Our King is immortal. But in that day and time of Isaiah, he realized that one king died, as all kings do, but one king lives forever like none other. Even in our day, with all the threats of terrorist attacks and the pandemic and the epidemics and the militant homosexuality, the cultural ugliness of all the riots and displaying that I am entitled because I have a color of skin or I am entitled because I have freedoms or I am entitled because I belong on the face of the earth. You have no entitlement. God is entitled to all of the world and we serve him. Why? Because he is holy and we are not. And so all of, all of it, with all the increasing persecution in all of the spiritual hostilities that exist within congressional leadership all the way down to the various churches of, of where we go, we realize that God is in control. When the plane hits the tower, God is in control. When the bullet strikes the president, God is in control. When, I, when, the, when the world comes to a standstill because of a pandemic, God is in control. When you're fired in your job, God is in control. When you're bankrupt, God is in control. No matter what you face in life, our God is in control and he remains holy and will continue to be holy even if we see all the unholiness around us. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw God. Will 2020 be the year you saw the Lord? Never fear, God is in control. Number two, and this becomes the most difficult but the most rewarding of the entire passage that you look at here in Isaiah verses one through eight. It is a time, that it's a time coming and it happens in every one of our lives and whatever happens is this, that we must confess our sinfulness to the king. No sooner had Isaiah seen the awesome display of God's holiness than his hands went up to shield his face and tears filled his eyes as if he realized that in the presence of the holiness there was unholiness. And he burst out with these words, Woe to me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, when we see the Lord, we see our sinfulness. We can make all the excuses in the world. There are no riding the fences in life. It is wrong and it is right. It is either or. It's not an in-between. Even though you and I deal with those things every day of our life and have become immune to all the things around us does not excuse the fact of what sin is and what it's not. It does not excuse the fact of what holiness is and what holiness is not. When Isaiah saw the Lord in his holiness, he saw himself in his sinfulness. When Isaiah saw the Lord in his holiness, he saw himself in his depravity. 
When Isaiah saw the Lord of hosts, he saw himself for who he really was. If you were to have asked people on the street what they thought of Isaiah during his time, I'm sure they would have told you he was a man of unquestioned integrity, that he had moral righteousness. He was the picture of holiness as a prophet. He was the paragon of virtue. And if you were to ask Isaiah before the encounter with the Lord of what he thought of himself, he would have probably shifted his feet a little bit, cleared his throat and said, you know, I'm, I got humility. I'm a pretty good old fella. You know, I'm a pretty good old guy. I've done some good things in my life. But after he saw the holiness of God, he says, woe is me. For everything I see is dirtiness. It took the deity to reveal the dirtiness of Isaiah's life. And it will always be the same with us. Many years ago, the Times of London ran a series of letters to the editor. And it, the question was, what's wrong in our world? Well, you can imagine a paper uh, as its reputation. There were many people who responded and they responded with all sorts of wonderful answers of what's wrong with our world. And then one Christian philosopher wrote back, and it seemed to close the session of many days and many weeks of debate. G.C. Chesterton, in his brief, to the point, hit the nail on the head, and he said, the problem is sin. But there's good news. God has the answer. You do not see in Isaiah where Isaiah has left the presence of God because he was unwelcomed. You will not see in that discourse of Isaiah where God says to Isaiah, because of your sinfulness, you cannot be used. You will not see in that discourse when Isaiah stands before the king and the king says, I agree with your dirtiness and I must turn my face from who you are. You don't see that. You see something else, just contrary, opposite of that. You see the seraphim, he says, flew to me and having in his hand a living coal that would take in from the tongs from the altar. The altar, you know, the Holy of Holies, the very sacred place where the priests enter into the Holy of Holies, and yet if they're burning incense, and yet they take a coal from that altar, it's the purest of all the fire, and he places it upon the lips of Isaiah, touches his mouth, and he says, Behold, this has touched my lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. He now sees himself for who he really is. He sees himself touched by the mercy, touched by the grace, touched by the forgiveness, touched by the hand of the king. And he has knighted him to stand in his court and to go into the world and to represent the holy, holy, holy Lord of hosts in all the kingdom. Like Isaiah we know it will hurt at some level to have the hot coals of God's holiness singe away the tough exterior of the pride of our life. But it will result in an incom incomparable gift of being new, redeemed, and forgiven. In the year that Uzziah died, Isaiah was renewed, or Isaiah was forgiven. Isaiah was redeemed by the Lord of hosts who is holy, holy, holy. Bring on the burning and bring on the coals. We all need to be touched and singed by the power of God's healing. Number three, in our relationship with the king. We must commit to the usefulness of the king. 
So Isaiah saw the, the God in all of who he was and the most important character of who God is, part of his character, that of holiness. And he saw where he was. He saw his dirtiness. And now it's all about committing to usefulness. The good news is that when God deals with the sinful heart, he can take the sinful heart and use it for a mighty purpose, whether it's in, in the farthest parts of the world or another state or the four corners of, of our continent. God can use us. When God chooses to use us in his service, it's not because he's seen something in us that's worthy of being tapped for his purposes. It's not because he needs a guy or a girl with credentials that will work in his favor. What he sees is his own holiness. A few clean vessels that are willing to let his love pour into and out of them at the bidding of the master. It's interesting, clean vessels. It is Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 and 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 and 7 says this, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants of Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, who is shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. But we have this treasure in earthly vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Until we have lowered our assessment of our own value to the earthen vessel, we can be of little or no use to the Father but once we have believed what God has revealed within us about who we really are without him, then there is no limit as to what he can do through us. A vessel that is considered intact and invaluable on the outside but dirty on the inside is of little use. Even a vessel that could be cracked and broken if it is scrubbed clean by the hands of the scrubber of the God of grace, of God's grace, then we can be put into a place of choosing and used as a refreshment for all who come near. So Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am a cracked vessel, and I cannot be used by God in the state that I am in. And thanks be unto God and glory be unto God that he has foreseen and touched me with his power and with his love and his mercy. And God's loving, merciful desire now is to equip this earthen vessel so that I can go out into his kingdom and serve him because it's all about the king and I. I will go wherever you send me. That's powerful. That's transformation in Isaiah's life. And if you hear one statement, this is the statement that I want you to hear above all else. When we come to the end of ourselves, we arrive at a whole new beginning. Isaiah came to an end in himself. Isaiah, what is the year that you can mark in your life that changed you for the rest of your life? Benji, it was the year that King Uzziah died. Why is that, Isaiah? Because I saw the Lord. Well, by seeing the Lord, what did he do? He showed me my sinfulness and I saw his holiness. And well, Isaiah, what happened because of that? Well, Benji, it, what changed in my life is with his grace and his mercy, he forgave me, he touched me, he cleaned me, he empowered me. Well, what's the result of all that, Isaiah? Benji, it is now I am going where God wants me to go. I'm going to do whatever God wants me to do. Here I am, send me. Powerful, isn't it? All because one king died and the other showed up who lived forever. You see, after the confession, 
comes the cleansing. And after the cleansing comes the calling. Here am I. As you hear Isaiah tell it, and I heard the voice of the Lord say, and whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here am I, send me. Here am I. Not here is he, send him. <laughs> Not here I am, but send the pastor. Not here I am, but send the missionary. Not here I am, but send the seminary trained professional. Not even here am I, but send someone else. Isaiah said, it is the only way that we can honestly say when we've seen God's holiness and been sickened by our own sinfulness, can we all agree and say, here I am, Lord, send me. How about me? Some people would argue that this kind of selfless surrender is no way to chart your path in life. It doesn't matter if you're the president of the United States or a king of a nation. It doesn't matter if you're a janitor cleaning the halls of a schoolroom or a trash collector getting trash off the beach. When we stand before the king of kings, no clout and no social economic status and no color of skin is going to matter. As we stand before the king, it all is about whether or not we saw him in our lifetime. I know God demands my total surrender. But let me put it to you this way. The only path to a personally blessed life, and I use the word only very deliberately, is through the full submission to the lordship of Christ. You and I can travel it, you know, try it, many different ways and we can travel down the journey in many different ways but I can guarantee without the Lord it is failure the Lord Jesus Christ is our king and we are his subjects his desire is always to do what is best for his kingdom that is why each day of our lives we must crown him Lord of all You know, you look at the history of nations, and over the last several months, you know, I've been inundated with different things and scrolling the internet and looking, just, just studying a little bit and, and fascinated over kingship and the subjects that are under the king and how powerful it relates to the understanding of Scripture that God is king of all and we are subject to the king. My heart bleeds for someone to stand up before a nation and fall on their knees and start crying out to God, God, I cannot handle this power. I cannot handle the responsibility that I have as a man or a woman. And I place before you this nation and I ask for the covering of your power and your might and your holiness to inundate these people. No decision will be made and no power struggle will happen until we submit our lives to the most powerful king of this world. I look and my heart bleeds for people to not worry about who's going to get the closest parking space or what matters when someone cuts you off in line. I bleed, my heart bleeds for people to submit themselves in humility before one another. Whether it's in congressional leadership, whether it's in the churches, whether it's in Walmart, or whether it's in the king's, king's palace. Whatever the king desires, it is always best for the kingdom. 
Whatever is best for the kingdom is always best for the church. And whatever is best for the church is always best for me and you. It is my prayer that we, his subjects, will crown him Lord of all. We'll crown him king moment by moment so that his power and his grace that we can get on with the business at hand of doing his kingdom business. Do you know what happened in Isaiah's life the year that King Uzziah died? Do you really understand what Isaiah did that day? He crowned the Lord as king of his life. He realized for the first time that he had no earthly king that gave him power, that gave him security, that gave him a sense of belonging. He realized that he was now living in a land that had no direction. He realized he was living in a land that had threats of armies ready to come in after five decades of peace and goodness that inhabited the land. Isaiah, for the first time in his life, realized that he had no king. Until the day Uzziah died, he saw the Lord and he fell on his face. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And Isaiah crowned him king of his life. Will you crown him king in your life today? Will you submit to his authority? Will you submit to his holiness? And will you pick up the baton as it's handed to you and go and do whatever he calls you to do? Will you demonstrate that you are useless without the king and useful for the king? Thanks be unto God, as today he is king and we are not. Father God, thank you. As we stand here in this message, I realized my position is sinful. And as a pastor to preach to a people that has exhibited way more holiness and goodness than I could ever do. But I stand here before you just like we all do together and we realize that in looking into the face of you and who you are, we see holiness and we see majesty. Father, I request to singe us with your coal of healing as we present ourselves in a prostrate position before you as king and as we kneel in humbleness and we bow before you. Father, help us to stand from that position of confession and the con position of humility to stand back and see you face to face, to look at the face in all its glory and all your holiness and to smile because of your smile upon our life that we have been knighted as your subjects in your kingdom and we will go and we will do wherever you call us to go and whatever you call us to do. Father, here am I. Send me. Thank you for wholeness, for peace, and for your touch. In your name that we pray. Amen.